I'd like to, are there any city council people here? Did I miss anyone? Okay. If you're a member of the Placentia Founders Society, which runs Bradford House, raise your hand. Thank you. And if you're a member of the Historical Committee, raise your hand. All right. We're so pleased to work with the Historical Society. And if you're not a member. Oh, yes. You don't really What happened to that? Thank you. Guess who's in charge of membership? I know, really good idea, Jill. Senior membership's only $20 a yeah. year. So we're not very expensive. You want to support us also. We have Christmas parties and lots of things for our members. And again, a senior membership is just like, or a single membership is $30, a senior is like 20 so it's not an expensive investment, but thank you. Uh, we're happy, we are the Placentia Founders Society, we run the Bradford House, which does belong to the city. If you haven't taken a tour, uh, it was the home of A.S. Bradford and his family and his citrus acres and acres and acres and then they discovered oil also which helped a bit and uh, they had two packing houses and they shipped through Sunkist. we have all kinds of labels in there that say bradford brothers bradford brothers the shipping and our tour does take you through all the rooms of the house you learn a lot about the family but also about what life was like at turn of the century orange county because they came in the late 1890s and uh, come on in, it's okay. okay. Have a seat, please. And there are some here. Well, no, we got a There's a council. Yeah. Yay. Welcome. Welcome. City Council. Yeah. And tell Kip Kerwin. Yeah. Yeah, all Sweet right. Kid. Stand up and introduce yourself. Hi, <laughs> Kevin Kerwin here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome Thank you. And so uh, we're pleased to have you. So the Bradford House actually belongs to the city. It was given to them by the heir, the eldest son of A.S. Bradford. And uh, the city wasn't sure what to do with it, and there was a fire. I lived down the street then, so I remember the fire. Mm -hmm. A lot of damage from the water in particular, and the house had been empty. The furniture was sold off. And the Placentia Founders Society was formed in 1973, so we could repair and, and use the house. Uh, we rented from the city for like a dollar a year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But we do everything. About the only thing the city does, they do pay for insurance for the building because they own it. But we have the insurance for damage or any of the interior effects. And we only control about five feet around the house. So if you have a complaint about the park, don't call me. <laughs> there is a wonderful city app that you can go on and tell them you have a concern. And they are really quick. We had a burnout light and it was fixed the next time I was here, so they're very good to us. So, the Placentia Family Society runs a Bradford house. We love it. It's part of our community and having lived close for 42 years, my kids played in the decaying orange trees years ago <laughs> before the house was refitted and uh, fixed up. A lot of the furniture is original. We're getting it back slowly. Um, we just recently got a Tiffany-inspired lamp over there that was given to us by one of their heirs. So that's the Founder Society. And we work closely with the Placentia Historical Committee, which doesn't necessarily run the Bradford House. They are a city committee designed to help preserve homes and uh, reinforce and teach the history of Placentia. They are the ones who had the brochure if you wanted to buy it out there for a dollar that has all the historical homes. And we have members of the historical committee here today. We're so oh proud to goodness. be able to cooperate with them on these presentations. We plan two of these a year. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Kathy Frizee, who is organized all of this. Okay. She yes. is a member of our board, member of the historical committee. Seems as if she's been involved in the history of Placentia since Day one. It started. <laughs> Almost. So, Almost. Kathy, thank you. Okay, well, I'm so glad so many of you were able to join us today. Well, it's always a, a hit and miss when we put out uh, invitations. You know, how many are going to be able to make it? And then how many are going to call us tomorrow and say, I missed it. Did you videotape it? So, we are videotaping it tonight. So, hey, there's four there's Eric Holbrin is coming in again for that. Coming in? There's a couple more seats. Okay, so first of all, we're going to have. Um, okay. Okay, well, first of all,
all, we're going to have Larry DeGraff is going to tell us about the uh, historical committee and how it started. And then one of its first tasks was the um, historical site oh. survey. Okay. 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 And he's still active in the historical community here in Placentia. So he's got some handouts here, and we'll pass those around when you tell me to do that, okay? Okay, well, it's a pleasure to see all of you. Boy, this place is hot today. Mm -hmm. Nice to see that. I won't buy a phone. <coughs> well, somebody else come. Maybe I will. Maybe they will. Maybe they will. Okay. Preserving the history of the city is a continuously changing activity. Uh, Going, Sanchez is going through several sets of activities to fulfill this need. We're now at a point learning to quote a saying that's going around quite a bit. The torch needs of preservation needs to be passed to a new generation. So one of the reasons I'm here today is to tell you what the old generation has done by way of preservation activities and see if there's some place you might like to fit in uh, for a newer generation of that. So, the earliest activity, I used to think that uh, the city-sponsored site survey that I helped direct in 1987-88 was the father of it all. No. It was a smaller group, uh, well, a group, the uh, Yorba, Sancha Yorba Heritage uh, Foundation, which in 1966 uh, was uh, actually a few years before 66 was incorporated as a private organization of women, almost exclusively, that uh, set up a historic home tour in 1966, which as far as I can see is the earliest uh, sort of organized operation to make Placentia uh, aware of its uh, heritage. <coughs> and I'm taking out <coughs> from that thing, if I can put together, an excerpt. Uh, that shows the spirit of preservation, unfortunately. But basically, uh, what, it, uh, what they said in their home tour of brochure was that uh, the uh, was changing completely. As they artfully put it, uh, the uh, orange rows and so forth were being pushed out by a wave of concrete and asphalt. And so what they wanted to do was to uh, restore, not go back to the past, but leave a heritage uh, that others would be uh, inspired to follow. Uh, he even suggested that if God is with us, uh, we will preserve uh, the spirit of the Sancha, even as its uh, more tangible character is being changed. So that was the first uh, thing that was done. There was no formal survey of uh, the Sancha uh, for over a decade after that. Then in 1987-88, uh, the city commissioned a uh, sur survey of any uh, properties, sites, so forth, in the city that would be deemed historic. And I was the head of the historical committee at that time, so we set up a uh, group uh, to undertake this. Now, one caveat, and those of you who say I'm very interested in historic preservation, <coughs> uh, what can I get out of it? We can get a great deal of history, but not necessarily a great deal of money. Almost all the efforts that have been made to preserve the city of uh, uh, essential historical resources have been done by volunteers. So we are still in good company here, uh, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Anyway, we had quite a survey uh, we did hire a professional to lead the whole thing, Diane Marsh of Santa Ana. And by the time we were done, we had uh, surveyed over 300 uh, buildings uh, to be possibly designated as historic <coughs> landmarks. Uh, that was far over about a year. Anyway, uh, these uh, landmarks were 
formally recorded. So I need now to go to uh, my, my, my tangible my part of my talk. How do you record a historical landmark? Okay, a few definitions. First of all, what is historical? You have to sort of set that up. And fortunately for us, at, uh, uh, the National Register of Historic Places, the U.S. government agency, and the California Historical uh, Office have both agreed on a set of uh, principles called the National Register of Historic Places in the United States. And the register says you got to be 50 years old before you're historical. Uh, with rare exceptions. So that message has been passed down to all the structures in the United States that want to be formally uh, called uh, historical. So that's the first thing you have to do. Secondly, what of any importance went on here as far as the city's history is concerned? What were the effects of whoever lived here or whatever things were done here on the history of the area in general? Third uh, thing, uh, exactly how would you categorize your type of building? Is it a house, a commercial building? It, it, does it have nothing to do with habitation? Maybe it's a, uh, a factory? Uh, is it a store? Uh, so you fit your area, uh, your uh, dwelling uh, structure into that category. Then there's a the question of what about the whole area you're in? Is, there, is this part of a distinctive district in the city of the center? Uh, if so, give it a name, and maybe you will have several different historical areas in the city. These are all things that have to be thought out to begin with uh, when you are trying to set up the, the uh, historical uh, study of your area. Now, fortunately, I think we in the center are at a stage where much of this has been uh, figured out. Uh, the city recently put a historic element in its general plan. Uh, that historic element recognizes certain areas or districts uh, as being historic. Uh, and uh, we have also uh, done uh, numerous uh, compilations of select buildings in uh, Placentia uh, on leaflets and so forth. Uh, the latest one that I have anyway is this uh, essential historic landmarks. Very nice topic, but Kathy may have something even more. Well, we have the, it's the copies that were at the front door. Oh, okay. Essentially the same information. Anyway, in uh, we have done quite a bit to promote a select number of historic houses. Here's the first peeve I have. Uh, not key, really, it's just something that we need to address. Everything was done in the context of it had to be 50 years old at least in 1987. What about buildings that have been historical time? After that, they have not gotten the same recording <coughs> things they've had. So first, and perhaps the biggest challenge of all of us in student historic uh, preservation is to go post-1987, 50 years, and see what uh, new buildings pop up. And uh, I will infringe on the next speaker who I think is going to deal with this, but the biggest uh, number of these is undoubtedly going to be suburban tracts. <coughs> How do you uh, record a suburban tract? Well, that's going to be something different. Uh, than what I'm going to tell you, which was the good old days where we simply <coughs> went building, went building. And we had the United States uh, the National Register of Historic Places uh, as a guideline. Okay, so that's, uh, that's where we are now as far as historic uh, places go. Now, the survey that we might do is of any new areas. Um, is of two types. Sometimes they're referred to as windshield surveys because you initially drive through an area to see if it has any historic buildings in it in a slow moving car uh, and 
take notes on this looks historical, that looks like it might be historic, or something like that. Now, if you're just dealing with a very small area or a few already pre selected buildings, then you probably would just walk your way through, hence it's called a walking survey. Either way, uh, there are certain components uh, to it. First, as I say, is age. This really is a tricky question. How do you find out how old it is? Well, once in a while, you can look out, like the neighbor next door to me, who when he bought his house, put a placard on it. This house was <laughs> built in 1970 uh, uh, something, I think. Um, but that's rare. Sometimes you have to uh, knock on doors. Sometimes you have to go to your city government, uh, the planning commission, or something else. Can you give me the dates of when this track was built? Something like that. But that's the first component you need is the age. Next component we need is the type of building. Uh, is it a house? Is it a uh, factory? Is it a restaurant? There are certain categories in which to uh, put that uh, building. Then you have to go to well, who owned this or who lived or worked here. Sometimes that's an interesting job. Has this ever changed? Was it one use one time and now it's something else? Was it owned by somebody one time and now it's owned by somebody else? So uh, those are things you sort of need to work out before you start to survey uh, other aspects of the property or declare that it's historic. Okay, one other thing. Oh, when you record all this information, and I'll pass around this example of a record, we call it the property uh, primary record, um, you need to, uh, uh, first of all, locate it. So most primary records, you draw a little map. And this is an example <coughs> of a little map. I'll also, I'll press this around so you can get a closer picture. I'll also note the two essentials for any sort of historic survey on a pen and a pad. A great deal of it is still done uh, just that way. Uh, and the maps are one example. The buildings will be another example. Here, you get into a little pesky thing. What is this house? Is it technically a bungalow? Is it uh, a ranch house? Or what? How many stories does it have? Uh, what roughly is its size? Besides, what period was it built? So all of these things, there are categories, lines for it in this uh, primary record, and you can put those things in. Then you get the question of, all right, what is the history of this? And history is generally divided into two categories. First, let's the building itself. This is where the professions of architecture and anthropology have really had a field in. They have taken over uh, the touring of environmental impact reports and other documents like that in which this sort of uh, information is uh, cited. So um, that, and that often is one of the biggest points of uh, a primary record of a historic house. The other big part, of course, is when the historians feel more at home, well, what happened here? Uh, any momentous events? Uh, did it significantly change in its use, so forth. So two mini essays, in effect, are created for each building that you uh, survey. And then uh, there's a few other things, uh, other books, data, and so forth on this people might like to look at, uh, and uh, photographs, so yes. Uh, First of all, you have a photograph of the exterior of the house. Then such other photographs as you might uh, want to keep in mind. Uh, here, for example, is the key wrench. And here are pictures of the exterior of the key wrench. And pictures of some of the other, you know, a picture of the landscape around the key wrench. I've seen some of these records that have as many as 10 photographs. Yeah. 
pass this around and we can look at it. So this is all the information, that, well, some of all the information that you gather uh, on a survey. Now, what comes next is that uh, these surveys, first of all, have to be written up in some uh, formal sense. Once again, usually using the uh, guidelines of the National Register. Um, and uh, so within a group of people doing a survey, you need to find one or two who will be sort of the secretaries of the group, because these forms need to be filled out. Uh, and uh, uh, ideally, sent to one of several organizations who would collect them. So who are you working for? Well, in Placentia, the city has uh, organized some of the surveys. Some of the brochures may have been done by the historical committee or others. Um, so that's, that's one uh, element to take care of. Another uh, is who is going to use this survey? If the city is going to use it for assessment or something like that, all right, maybe the final report will be uh, sent to the city. If, uh, if businesses want to know what's going on vis-a-vis uh, -vis old business uh, buildings, maybe the Chamber of Commerce, so like that would be. So uh, figure out uh, when you start a survey, What's the ultimate use of this survey going to be, and who logically would want to have this information close at hand? I would say the minimum is any city library wants to have a copy of the record you do on, uh, on this. And probably, if you have a historical society, uh, they should also. Uh, and um, city government, any sign it has uh, its own uh, needs for them. All right, a few more comments on the uh, uh, conduct of a survey. As I say, you want most often begin with an initial uh, windshield or walking survey, uh, but uh, sometimes it goes on uh, to uh, a con collection of these reports into some sort of summary. I have a summary here someplace from uh, 1987. Yeah, this is it. Um, yeah, here's a summary. And here what they have done is to categorize the buildings by type. Residences, residences subdivided into architectural types, businesses, um, this, when this was done, packing houses are still a big business in Placentia. Uh, so I have a series of those, uh, and uh, churches, uh, organizational things. So that all gets put together, uh, and <coughs> the group that did the survey uh, generally presents this as some sort of a report on uh, the historical places. So I could, of course, I could stop here with one more comment I'd like to make. When well, the 1966 tour was set up by the women's groups, it was a pioneering ta task because nothing like that had been done, and the center was at a cutting turning point. The ranching days were over, and a suburban uh, task force was coming in. <laughs> Today, a similar challenge prospect is in place. The suburbs have been well developed. But some of the things that go with them, shopping centers, uh, other uh, commercial businesses, uh, industries are sprouting up. So I think now is an ideal time to think about doing a survey post-1987. And it will take in a, perhaps a wider variety of businesses, maybe a wider variety of what I'm coming to call cultural considerations, ethnic groups that live in certain communities, uh, for one example. So this would be my challenge 
to you who want to pick up a torch, there are totally new things that need to be done to the new areas that need to be looked at. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. This around. There are incidentally uh, all sorts of, word of uh, uh, guidebooks available. Uh, here's one, uh, how to nominate a resource, California's Register of Historical Resources. And uh, these things, take a look at them. Okay, Larry, if you want to hear any questions, if you want to see can, you can see the slides. No, no, no. Those are the application things. Kathy? No, questions. Yes, questions. Yes, oh, I have We're one. going to do questions again. Suppose, now, suppose inst <laughs> instead of undertaking the whole survey, there's just like one particular house that wants to be done. Uh, is that possible, or does it have to be like a whole survey of the city at one oh, time? No, no, it's quite possible. Uh, the city sometimes acts this way. For instance, it had a survey of, uh, of the potential site for a metropolitan uh, train station. Uh, that's a significant and important self. A single house by a private citizen is impossible. Um, if you uh, uh, get the, direct, uh, the directions to how to do a historical register uh, nomination, and that's what they're all these nominations uh, that you can go on your own. But at a certain point, uh, you should yeah. contact uh, either the State Office of Historic Preservation or some other preservation organization because, as we found, sadly, in our first big survey in 1987, we didn't contact the State Office of Historic Preservation. So our survey is never officially recorded. Oh, and okay. that's a very important thing. The historic preservation ultimately is usually formally uh, uh, examined and recorded in uh, public offices. That was my second question, which is going to be, what happens if it's a privately owned residence and the owners say, forget it, I'm not interested? <laughs> okay. Uh, you have hit one of the real problems with historic preservation because we uh, when we finished our gigantic survey, we then went back to a second phase. Would you like to, this to be formally registered as a historic house? Well, what would that mean? Have to, well, first of all, you have to consider the integrity. That is, are you keeping this house as a, pretty much as it was when it was originally built? Uh, if you you can even get rewarded for making your house uh, uh, an historic house. The Mills Act does that, but the Mills Act is very strict on what you can and cannot change. One key to that, the State Office of Historic Preservation is very interested in saving the outside. We were rather surprised in 1988, mm -hmm. remember how insignificant the inside seemed to be. Uh, so you can keep your new uh, electronic uh, uh, kitchen devices just don't get your stuff all outside or something like that. So um, uh, that would be one of my tips. Too.